Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Matura. I am the co-chair of CAA Arts Access. And I wanna thank you all for joining us today for a discussion about For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough by Entezake Shange. This is brought to you by the Columbia University Alumni Association and Arts Access. Uh, I hope everyone who was in the audience last night had a great time. And for everyone else that's uh, about to see the show, I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, so I wanna introduce now our panelists for today. Uh, First up, uh, Ron Simons, uh, CEO of Simon Says Entertainment. He leads the strategic planning and development of theater and film projects, including the critically acclaimed films Night Catches Us, Gun Hill Road, Blue Caprice, and Mother of George, all of which premiered at Sundance. His first documentary, 25 to Life, premiered at the American Black Film Festival, where it won the Grand Jury Prize for Best Documentary. He also has produced Broadway productions of A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, uh, which we also had a uh, arts access event for. Uh, the Gershwins, Porgy and Bess, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, um, A Streetcar Named Desire, mm -hmm. and many others. Uh, his off-Broadway projects include Bedlam Theater's Hamlet and St. Joan, uh, and he received the Emerging Producer Award at the 2017 National Black Theater Festival opening gala. As an actor, he has appeared on stage, film, and television, including Blue Caprice, Night Catches Us, Law and Order, Law and Order Criminal Intent, and As the World Turns. He's a member of the Broadway League and the Screen Actors Guild and holds a membership with the Elite Producers Guild of America. In 2017, he starred in Netflix's hit new crossover Marvel series, The Defender. Next, we have Professor Farah Jasmine Griffin, who's the William B. Ransford Professor of English and Comparative Literature and African American Studies at Columbia University, where she also served as the inaugural chair of the African American and African Diaspora Studies. Professor Griffin received her BA in History and Literature from Harvard and her PhD in American Studies from Yale. She is the, she is the author, I'm losing my, <laughs> losing my place, uh, or editor of eight books, uh, including Who Set You Flowin', The African-American Migration Narrative, If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery, In Search of Billie Holiday, and Harlem Nocturne, Women Artists and Progressive Politics During World War II. Griffin also collaborated with composer, pianist Jerry Allen and director, actor Esapatha Murkison on two theatrical projects for which she wrote the book. The first, Jerry Allen and Friends Celebrate the Great Jazz Women of the Apollo with Liz Wright, Diane Reeves, Terry Lynn Carrington, and others, which premiered on the main stage of the Apollo Theater in May of 2013. The second, A Conversation with Mary Lou, featuring vocalist Carmen Lundy, premiered at Harlem Stage in March 2014 and was performed at the John F. Kennedy Center in May of 2016. Her most recent book, Read Until You Understand, The Profound, Profound Wisdom of Black Life and Literature, was published by Norton in September of 2021. Griffin is a 2021 to 2022 Guggenheim Fellow and Mellon Foundation Fellow in residence. Finally, last but not least, Stacey Star Sargent, who stars in For Colored Girls. Uh, she is the child of Trinidadian and Tobagonian parents. Uh, she was born and raised in East New York section of Brooklyn. She's a graduate of LaGuardia High School and received her BFA in musical theater from Syracuse University. Stacy can be seen in the critically acclaimed Netflix film, The 40-Year-Old Version, and in the third season of Nat Geo's genius, Aretha. She most recently guest starred and recurred on CBS's Blue Bloods and Bowl, respectively. Sargent received Drama Desk, Drama League, and Lucille Lortel nominations for her work in the New York Times Critics Pick, Rags Parkland Sings the Songs of the Future at Ars Nova. Uh, and she is also in her filmmaking debut, Though I'm Not Perfect, uh, which was an autobiographical documentary short about the physical and psychological dangers of the ballet world to young girls, which won the Honolulu Film Award for Best Educational Film. Mm. So we have an incredible panel here uh, to talk about this work and this show, which uh, you must absolutely see or see again, uh, which we just uh, was just announced has seven Tony Award nominations. So congratulations to the team on that uh, and is currently running through June. Uh, so just to get started here, uh, I would love to start with Professor Griffin, uh, just to give us some context about this 
this work. So officially it's billed as a choreo poem uh, and it premiered in 1976 uh, from a collection of separate poems that were written and then uh, codified into this, uh, into this script. So I'd love to hear from Professor Griffin just to get us started uh, about some of the cultural context of its premiere um, and then a little bit about uh, the road from, from that to today, which is quite broad, but um, just to get us started. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be a part of this panel and um, really excited about uh, all the excitement that this production is generating. Um, I am probably, you know, one of the oldest people here. I remember I was a teenager when, when this play first hit Broadway. Um, and, you know, in the mid 70s, uh, Entozaki Shange had been doing kind of performances with reading her poetry and dancing with other dancers on the West Coast before bringing it to New York and developing it as a play. And um, I think it has become such an important part of our theatrical canon that we sometimes forget about the controversy that surrounded it when it first opened. Again, as you said, it came to Broadway in 76. Um, these are the times when we are just beginning to get a kind of new wave of voices of Black women artists. So you think of like 1970, Toni Morrison's first novel, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings just a year before, Alice Walker's first novel. By 76, there's still something new and exciting, the feeling that there's a renaissance of Black women, but there's, and, and Shange certainly is among the most gifted and at the forefront and among the most innovative of those artists. And there was also a lot of pushback that in telling black women's stories, honestly, truthfully with the beauty and the range that she does, that Morrison does, that they were exposing dirty laundry, um, that they were um, resulting in you know, conversations that showed the conflict between gender um, and within the black community instead of the confrontation between black and white. And so she caught a lot of flack for doing this, but um, the choreo poem was an innovative new form in theater. Um, her brilliance, the sort of lyricism of her poetry connected to the dynamism of movement. Um, there was just nothing like it. And since that time, I think that um, most <laughs> colleges um, have tried to do their own versions of For Colored Girls. Um, every young Black woman who aspires to be in, on stage in college has probably performed some version of this play. But to see it come back again um, all these years later, when questions and issues of gender and gender equity and race are again at the center of our discourse, um, but in a very different way, um, just is a testament to the classic that Shange gave us and that it can be revitalized to speak to us in current times. Well, thank, thank you so much for that. And I, I wanna just ask you a follow-up about this because you were talking about the difference between now and, and then. So I'd love to just hear you elaborate a bit, a bit more on that, uh, just sort of this idea of some, some things change and then other things, other things don't with, with progress. So just, just to follow up on that point. Well, I think that Shange, uh, um, along with those other writers that I mentioned, whether it be Alice Walker or Tony Cade Bambara, um, June Jordan, you know, they really were new voices um, and the kind of idea of black women producing in all these genres and all these forms um, was new, right? Um, and it was sort of cutting edge and it was the sort of topic of conversation. And now I think that um, we are less surprised that some of the um, best literary and artistic production comes from the pens of black women, but that's largely because of what they did. So in that way, it's very different. Although I think things like, um, you know, misogyny, unfortunately, we seem to be in a new age of misogyny or, um, or, or sexual violence, gender-based violence, um, those things unfortunately still resonate with us today. Um, you know, the, the threat of sexual violence and domestic violence to, um, 
young Black women still resonates with us. I think another difference is the very concept of gender. The very concept of gender um, has just kind of exploded and gender categories are different. Our ways of thinking about gender is different. And yet the play still speaks in very interesting ways to us, even though that way of thinking about gender didn't exist when the play first came out. I wanna send this now uh, to, to Stacy, who plays the lady in blue, uh, who specifically has um, monologues that, that deal with this issue. And I'd also love to hear from Stacy, just following up on the choreo poem point of as an actor, how do you approach a choreo poem versus a script? Uh, particularly because in, in this play, we have uh, Lady in Blue, Lady in Red, uh, they're not named. However, they do come from specific places. Uh, they, they're geographically located, but they don't have names. So I'd love to hear from Stacy as an actor about, about process and approaching this, how it's similar, how it's different, and then expressing uh, many, many of these ideas that Professor Griffin was talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so in terms of my approach to Lady in Blue and, and this whole piece in general, I think that it, it really did not feel like I was taking on a character. I feel like it's it's really me speaking, finding my entry point in each one of these poems. And I can definitely relate in some way, shape or form to the experience that uh, Ntozake shares in all of the poems that I do. And so for me, it was honestly having the courage to be honest and open about my own experiences with mm. these uh, issues. Um, and I think, you know, speaking to the fact that like the the women are not named, wear colors. And I've also in, in the research that I've done, there were times when the women who previously played this could step into literally any one of these poems um, on any particular night. So it's not like a regular play where there's this linear arc for each character and you're on that singular journey. We literally could step into any one of these monologues if, if we were asked, you know what I mean? Uh, so the one thing that I think is linear for me is that it is a journey to myself and a journey, I, I think that we're all looking for love. And I think the journey for Ntozake, as well as my own personal journey, is not looking outside of myself for that, right? By the time we get to the end of the play, uh, Lady in Red and all of us, <clears throat> in the way that uh, it's written, we all say, I found God in myself and I loved her fiercely. And so I think that that's the linear journey. Um, but outside of that, it was about making, finding my way, my entry point in that was uh, specific to me and my experience as a black woman. Well, that's, that's so beautiful. And I think it's quite courageous to actually just have it, you know, literally be yourself and, and your story. And I, I, so I'd love to also then just following up with the point about the choreo poem to hear from you about how the dance aspects in the movement helped you in that journey, because also you know, there's plenty of plays where you don't have as much movement and, and music. So I'd love to hear about sort of how that worked into the the character because as a choreo poem, you know, it's not quite a musical, it's not a play. So, you know, how you integrated all those aspects of how uh, how this this works. Yeah, I think, well, I'll just talk about the process as a, as a whole, how Camille approached this process. So normally in a play or a regular musical, you come in the first day, you have a read through of the play. What Camille did was ha she did a dance through to familiarize us with the vocabulary of the movement of the entire piece. And I think what she has brilliantly done, you know, the choreography that you see in the opening section is revisited in the end, but there's a different, um, there's a different attack, there's a different feeling to it. And that was something that she really um, 
she crafted and made sure that whatever movement we was we were doing, how is it different from when we start and and tapping into, you know, it starts from a very joyful place. And I think the the full circle of it is getting back to that joy and freedom and uh, liberation that a child has, because when we're born, we we come in knowing we are worthy and then we ex have experiences that chip away at that and it's about finding that again and so i think it's it's just brilliantly crafted in that way um that it's a a a, a, a remembering of re like re putting putting ourselves back together um yeah, I don't know if that, I hope that answers your question. I, I think it does really, really brilliantly. And I, I wanna take this now back to Professor Griffin because just to, not to, to overstress the point, but the title has uh, for colored girls who have considered suicide. So we have that title. And then what Stacy just said, which I totally agree with of this element of joy, affirmation, love. So. I'd love to hear more about, you know, how, how, how do we get there? And this really front and center, the word suicide, violence for colored girls who have considered suicide. Um, this is very, um, it's very powerful, but it's frightening in the same way. And so how do we, how do we get that, that journey? And how did Shange envision that journey? Well, first of all, I mean, I think Shange broke a silence just with the title because one of the mythologies, um, and, and, and in some ways it was based in reality that suicide rates weren't especially, weren't, weren't as high amongst African-Americans as they were amongst other groups of people. But that then turned into a mythology that black women didn't consider suicide, right? And Shange broke that taboo and says, oh, you know, not only this is for those, you know, and, and, that, and that it's to acknowledge that we do get to a place of despair, of deep despair. But the title itself does so much work because it's like acknowledging that one can get to the place of despair and then also acknowledging the rainbow, right? And that's the journey that the, the choreo poem takes us on for each of those women. And then in that depth of despair, right? This is what Shange says, in the depth of despair, is when, you know, there's something else. There's the rainbow, there's the tree, there's the love of self and that's God in myself. And then that line, and I loved her, right? Not I loved him. <laughs> I loved her, I loved her fiercely. I mean, I can, I can remember first reading that line and, as a teenager and weeping. Right. Um, and so I think that you're so right. Um, the suicide is there. It, it's an acknowledgement. It's a recognition. Right. And, and, and legitimize that, yes, we do face despair. Of course we do. Um, but there's this other possibility on the other side of it. Right. The rainbow is on the other side of that, which is just so beautiful. And I think that the way Stacy described her character, her entering into character, the movement, the narrative of the movement um, is just so beautiful because it, it, it aligns with that, with that trajectory. So with, with, that, with that being said, and, and to follow up from Stacey talking about her journey, I'd love to hear now from, from Ron, now that we've talked about the cultural context and uh, what, this, what this means, I'd love to hear from, from Ron about uh, his ideas about presenting this this story uh, and bringing this story, which which has this history and has this meaning to so many people, um, just as I said uh, to Stacey, is quite courageous to put yourself out there. I think the same from from Ron uh, to to present this as a as a producer. So I'd love to hear to hear more about that too. Do we have to? I really want to hear more from Dr. Griffin and Stacy. To be really honest, I am totally engaged and entranced by what they're saying. I feel like what I I don't need to be here. They really are giving us a beautiful painting of what this whole thing is about. But if you hold my feet to the fire, I will say that oh, I am the one. 
I consider it, um, I'm very humbled by being part of the team that pulled this together. And I feel very, very honored um, because like Stacy and uh, Professor Griffin, I, I learned of this play when I was a teenager as well. Um, I grew up in a family that was led by women. I'm an only child. So I spent most of my time with my grandparents. Most of that was with my grandmother. And then the other part of the time with my mom, you know, I had a bevy of friends who just happened to be, you know, women, girls at the time coming up. And this piece for me, I think Stacy echoed this. I see so many of my family and friends in this piece. I feel like I know these women personally. I see my mother, I see my grandmother, I see my best friend, Cherie, may she rest in peace, my cousin, Rachel. I see all of these people telling their stories. And this is why I really appreciate this story because there is such a note of authenticity that Intazake and Camille and these ladies who are on stage, the seven ladies who are on stage, um, they do speak from a very personal place, right? And, and to be a part of, you know, bringing those words to fore, you know, before everyone came on, I was, um, Professor Griffin was talking about a lot of connections to, you know, Black girls. And I was like, well, that's definitely the population I most want to see, not everybody, but most want to see. Um, also went into that is that when I learned that the play hadn't been uh, revived in 46 years, um, while other playwrights have been revived three, four, five, six, you know, I, it, I felt like, I felt like we were shorting, you know, the American theater by not remounting this on Broadway. It has been done around the country, you know, by a lot of women, as Dr. Griffin says, so many girls read and know about this, you know, coming up. But to bring it on the main stage of Broadway, to remind the world, because Broadway is a platform that a world, the world can look to, um, I thought was very important because I think she, in some ways, has fallen away um, from the minds of some people, right? I think that there are a lot of people who I've met, uh, mostly not African-American, who never even heard of Ntozake Shange, which to me was like, really? Wow. That's like, you, you haven't heard of Shakespeare? Because that's where in my mind where she lives. So that was part of it as well. And also I thought that this piece was needed right now. I feel like in this, anti-racist movement that we apparently are in when in the wake of George Floyd's murder, that, that we need ways to heal. And for me, this play is about reducing hate and ignorance, both of which drive racism. Because I feel as though if we invite people into the, our living room for 90 minutes, right? And if you're not of African descent, you get to listen and, 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 and experience. I often call, say to see this show is not to see it, it's to experience it. You know, and you can come in and sit down and learn and hear from a variety of African-American women on many issues so that you hopefully can chip away some of that ignorance that you think you have of what it means to be an African-American woman. And now you have seven women who are giving you their authentic voices and it's not a monolith, but their ideas as expressed by Ntozake uh, of what it means to be an African-American woman. So all of those are the part of the reasons. And then of course, you know, working with Camille Brown, which is just extraordinary. Um, I, uh, she's just extraordinary. It's just it's really, if you don't know her, seriously, Google her. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm I'm glad I held your feet to the fire. That was that was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I and you know you said that it's very important for right now, and I, I'm just really I'm struck by just from what Stacy said about this telling her story of just how relevant this this piece still is, even from having premiered in in 1976, and it's still telling these stories that that need to be told and. Just based on that point, I want to um, go back to Professor Griffin, and there's this uh, a line from the show, which is so uh, beautiful, from the lady in yellow, and she says, 
my spirit is too ancient to understand the separation of soul and gender. Um, and so thinking about any sort of feminist critiques of, of this work or current, um, just on that, that point, so this uh, too ancient to understand the separation of soul and gender, I, I, it's, I mean, poetry is extraordinary. And I, so I'd love to hear more on, on that point. Yeah, there, she has so many lines like that. I mean, they're the lines that hit us that, you know, those of us who love Entozake, um, you know, they're like scripture <laughs> um, in so many ways. Um, and then there are the lines that we hit upon again when we see the play again, and that's one of them. And one of the things I, lo I love about that line is that I think it resonates with so much else in the choreo poem in that um, these are specific, you know, these are these are women that are not named because they're every woman, all right, in that traditional way of every man. They're every woman, and they're every woman through time, that the soul itself is, is so ancient, right, that the body might be mired in a particular historical context, but that the soul transcends that, right, and that it, um, you know, that, that it, it takes, it takes you know, that line is, leaves us with a question, like, what does it mean? Does it mean that the soul is connected to a gender identity? Does it mean that the soul can operate throughout different gender identities? And knowing Entozake, to me, that's what I've always thought she said, right? That the soul can operate along gender identities that in 1976, people weren't even imagining, right? Um, so I, I, I think you've picked out something that's yet again, one of those lines like scripture, um, in this book that, that, you know, maybe a secular scripture um, that this whole choreo poem is. Well, it, it brings me to this idea of when you have poetry that you can have specificity, but also universality so that you can tell this story that's important to black women and black girls, but then you can also still speak to, to everyone in this way, which I, I think when that's when you say scripture as well, I think of something that is meant to speak to everyone. Yes. I, yeah, and I, I wanna bring this back now to, to Stacy um, in this gesture towards the end, and this is kind of following up on what you were talking about before, but um, the, the laying of hands at, at the end, which I, I find really beautiful, which is just sort of like an ancient gesture and I, idea. And I'd love to hear more about that and also just this cleansing aspect and getting back to the idea of the, ritual nature of theater, which sort of like scripture and like church of where you repeatedly engage in activities that are meant to cleanse and elevate. And specifically with that and your, your feelings as that happens, because it does have a very sacred feeling at the end of the work. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the isolation that we've all experienced in this pandemic. And this show, is a healing, I believe, for anyone who is able to experience it. But also, as actors, we spoke about this in the rehearsal room because we, for me, it was the first. It was the first time that I was in a rehearsal since the pandemic, um, <clears throat> and to have that connection with these women to be able to literally touch other people, um, you don't realize how much that is necessary to our well-being, you know? And so for me personally, being a part of this cast and having that moment, it, it is a healing every night. Um, and then also, you know, with Our Lady in Red, being pregnant and all of that energy going into her, into her, her, her baby girl is um, honestly there, words would fail me right now. It, it is really a feeling and um, it is a feeling of, of love and like extreme, extreme love and knowing that there is new life coming into this world um, that we've spent 90 minutes pouring into ourselves, into 
what it is to be a black woman and then knowing there's another generation coming um there's i don't even know how how to put words to what that is it is it's it's a spiritual experience and everyone that i've talked to <clears throat> who's seen the show they all comment on the love that they are experiencing that they're that they're witnessing between us and and we're all like oh yeah that's real that is a real thing we we fell in love with each other the first week of rehearsals and every every day it's like i adore these women more and more and more and more and more um and i think that it it it's ancestral honestly is what it feels like um and I think it's just another uh, way Camille has brought Ntozake's words to life through the physical, the, the choreo part of this poem. She says, a laying on of hands. She says, I was missing something. I say, a laying on of hands. And, and we literally, we lay, we, we lay those hands on each other. We love on each other. We love each other fiercely. We love ourselves fiercely because after that we're laying our hands on ourselves. Uh, so I just, it, it, it's just an extension. And I think uh, Ntozake left the direction in her words. And I think Camille just listened. You know, she truly is the perfect vessel for this to go through. Well, I love that you're talking about community and the sense of that you in the cast and then what you're representing through these gestures is community, which is bound by love. And then the community supports itself through that love, which kind of brings me to this question, which I want to take back to Professor Griffin about you know, this is this ritual aspect and it's expressing love. Um, what your sense of Shange, if if she was actually also pushing then for a social political change through this representation and um, you know exactly exactly what that was because you know we do have this beautiful theatrical work and then if there was a very specific political bent of 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 change and I, I also just want to bring up because at the end there's quite this uh, long monologue from the lady in red um, which really brings us in, into her world in this um, the sense of violence and the child being you know dang that whole that whole uh, aspect which is really frightening, um, which to me feels like it's bringing up a very particular socioeconomic argument um, and political argument. So I'd love to hear about, about that. So by all means, I mean, I think that all of Shange's work, um, it's not didactic, you know, it's not, um, it's not a political manifesto. It's what the best of art is. And the best of art is political in a sense that it makes us think about our humanity and then it makes us think about the conditions that try to limit our, the expression of our humanity, the fullest expression of our, um, of our humanity, of our capacity, right? So in that way, it's always political with her. Um, I think that she's also someone who tells us, you know, be careful about even the political boundaries of nationhood um, and how nationhood, like our, our, our allegiance to a nation or a nationality can stop us from being open and capacious and having a worldview that is larger. So, you know, Shange's work will always have Spanish speaking people in it. <laughs> she's always gonna have like Afro Latinas in her work and um, she's gonna have music that is not just, you know, based out of one ethnicity. And I think there are political implications for all of that. And also it's feminist, you know, it's, it's, it's feminist, but in a way that doesn't say, oh, um, you know, men are no good. It's like, let's imagine the world if um, women's needs and concerns and, and desires were made as important as those of men. That would be a good world for men and women, mm. right? Um, if poverty weren't um, an obstacle, right? So I think it's political in, all of her work is political in that way. And this certainly because of the context in which it was written, but again, never didactic, never didactic. 
Absolutely. And I, I, I want to follow up on that, um, just this political, because uh, at the beginning, uh, the mention of Toussaint Louverture, um, which is in, in, a, in a sort of comedic way, we have this, this girl that's, you know, like in love with him, but then specifically politically. So the revolutionary hero of Haiti. And I just love it because it's such a specific reference in the work. And when a choreo poem, which is about love, and then that figure. So I'd, I'd just love to hear more about that. No, I mean, I remember when I first read the play as a teenager, you know, Toussaint Louverture was one of my childhood heroes too. And so I so identified with that young girl falling in love with him. But yes, because she's situating her, this little girl who's in the United States, who understands um, this, this struggle that is a struggle that's um, a struggle that happens for Black freedom across national boundaries, across um, language barriers, like all the like, you know, Zake is the kind of person who says, you should speak every language that black people in the world speak, which means that you should speak every language because they're everywhere. Um, and so I think that there's that kind of consciousness, um, which is a consciousness of fierceness, a uh, willing to struggle, and that struggle is part of the tradition um, that we have inherited and, and that she makes that very clear early on, as you say, in this kind of humorous, fun play, even with the juvenile, um, you know, the, 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 the juvenile consciousness of the young girl. You can follow the young girl throughout all of Shange's work and, and certainly here as well. Well, I want to just then bring that back to, to Stacy um, and this, and I think you kind of spoke about this before, but um, your feelings about this, this process of, uh, working with these characters that are kind of so fearlessly expressing sexuality, uh, whether they're younger or older or sexual violence, pregnancy, all of these things. Um, so as as an actor, and then, you know, sort of throughout your your career, how you felt about this opportunity or or if it was frightening at first to express all of these things as as an actor on stage or or if that was sort of just like, you know, the really thrilling maybe. Uh, so that's what I'd love to hear just about that. Definitely not frightened because that's that's my job, right? Yeah. yeah. Like that's what I've been tasked with in this lifetime as I've chosen to be an actor or acting chose me. Um I think for me personally, the most frightening thing was dancing again. I started out in ballet, but I had it more recently. I was doing more straight plays and television and film. And so just um, reacquainting myself with my body and moving this way and having to be conditioned to do it eight times a week was, was the, the most fearful <laughs> thing about it. But it's an actor's dream to have like, the, the, these words are delicious, you know, it's, it's, I'm like, yes, more, please, thank you. <laughs> um, and to, again, it's like to, to make it personal and honest, uh, so that it speaks to the heart of anyone that is witnessing what, what we're doing, what we're saying, um, how we're moving, like there, there has to be honesty in the movement as well, right, and meaning behind every single movement. Uh, so there, there was never, there's never, for me, in terms of, of text, there's never fear about exposing myself because that that's what I signed up for <laughs> at the end of the day you know what I mean um and every night it's it's different depending on the audience or what's going what I've walked into the theater with on that particular day uh and that's the for me that's the the joy for me because the, it's like science almost like you just the alchemy is different every day and it's like okay well I'm not going to force it force any particular feeling it's just like where am I today and how can I be honest in this moment that's, that's the word <laughs> I, I love that and I want to just bring up the fact of and what you've talked about is this holistic approach that you've taken to the character because being this choreo poem there are what you might call monologues but there aren't very many uh, scenes where you have sort of like line, 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 line between mm -hmm. actors, but 
uh, as an ensemble, you've developed a very incredible community in the sense that I do feel like on stage you are dialoguing with each other, even though your words are are monologues. And I, I so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because you said you were doing a lot of straight plays, so you're line to somebody, line back, line to somebody, line back, and that's not happening here. But I I still feel the connection in the network that mm -hmm. that you've developed. Yeah, I I mean my approach to monologues in general is never like I'm always talking to someone. So even though there aren't scripted lines, I my and this is just me personally and everyone's process is different, but whenever I'm speaking, I'm hearing or I've made up the other lines that motivate me to say the next line in my monologue. Right. So that's how I chose to approach uh, this work. But also there are things that are very clear, for example, in the um, sorry monologue, just the way it's written. I also try to pay attention to where I'm breathing so that it, it is like Shakespeare. And there, there, there was a certain point in my process where I was like, I have to get this particular section out in one breath. That is the way it's written. And once I did that, there was always there's there's always an audience response. And it's the the section where uh, she says, um, um, oh my goodness. I'm like, I have to be on the stage to say it. No, <laughs> um, where she says, uh, and I will list in detail every one of my wonderful lovers and their ways I will play. Like if I take a breath before I will play Oliver Lake, like it's just, it just doesn't, it, it works, but it doesn't, you know what I mean? Um, so there's also that to me, that's the, the poetry part of it, but I'm always approaching it as, a conversation, even though it's a monologue. Well, so you mentioned um, Shakespeare, and I feel like we've kind of been talking about this point and in mentioning scripture. And so I want to um, ask Professor Griffin um, about this point, and if I can articulate it correctly. Uh, so this, this, the kind of dividing line between when you have a, a text and then a performance, and how Shange might have envisioned, um, you know, that she created this text that can be studied and written about, but then also has to live through performance and how, how it evolves through performance. Um, you know, sort of like, just like we're talking about Shakespeare, who has gone so much beyond uh, the person who wrote these plays in the 1590s. And if that was part of Shange's vision that she would create this text that, that would be read as a text as we read Hamlet and we write papers about Hamlet and then that it's also something that's continuously performed because quite a few plays, restoration comedies don't really get performed anymore um, that, that fade away into like a sort of text versus performance. Um, so I'd just love to hear sort of sort of about that because you know it is it is a living text, but she passed away in 2018. So she might be entering the beginning of a Shakespeare phase if, if you think. Yeah, so I would encourage everyone um, watching to take advantage of the fact that you are Columbia affiliates. Um, Shange went to Barnard and Barnard was very forward thinking in um, honoring her while she was alive. And there are wonderful recordings of Shange talking about her work, about the play. There are recordings of her with her college friend, Tulani um, Davis talking about it. Um, so that you can actually hear the living playwright talk about the work and um, her papers are also at Barnard as well. So, but to answer your question, Daniel, I think, you know, Shange wrote in every genre. She wrote novels, she wrote um, plays, she wrote poems and plays that are poem, poems that are plays. She wrote a cookbook. I mean, she wrote in every genre. And I think that for colored girls was always, um, she understood it as a text um, and knew that people would read it and it came out as a book, right? But it was always a performance and it was always meant for, you know, women like Stacy to, to bring life into it through breath and body and movement and language and understanding that 
things changed and she had very particular notions. She didn't like seeing college performances of it sometimes because she thought that, you know, they just, it wouldn't work. And when it did, it was great. And, you know, so um, I, I think that I don't, I, I don't, I don't know specifically, but I would imagine that for this work, um, the lived performance, the staged in the moment performance is how is given primacy. Um, even though she understood and it also, this is the thing, it works on the page. It works as an extraordinary piece of literature on the page. Um, and that's the gift of, of Entozake Shange. I, I, I would totally agree. I, I think it is so beautiful on the page, but as you said, it it is also this, it, this incredible experience. Um, and so, you know, I wanna bring this now back to Ron because Ron is one of the presenters of this experience who helped bring this experience back to people um, so that you can buy a ticket as you should buy a ticket uh, to go see it. And so um, I'd love to hear from Ron now, just from what we've talked about of, in, you know, you've mentioned uh, Camille a few times. And so how you, when you had this text and this experience, how you kind of thought about the the team that that you were going to, to build. Uh, well, before I answer that question, um, I do want to say this. Um, in Stacey's, one of Stacey's monologues, she quotes a lot of musicians and artists. And I really encourage everyone who will see the play or has seen the play to listen to the work of those artists. Don't let them just fly by and I, go, I don't know who they are. Really, if you understand, want to understand a perspective and a, and a context from which she wrote, there's a reason why she put all these musicians in the story, right? Because they're important to her. So listening to their work in some ways brought me closer to understanding who she was. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, now I forgot the question that you asked me. Wait. Oh, about uh, yeah. so it's about crafting this this experience. We're talking about it being a, a theatrical experience that you can read it, but you also have to be there. You should go. You need to see the show. You should buy a ticket. You have to be in the room. So how you crafted this particular experience, this particular production for now, and the people that you chose to to do this and bring this back to life. And I know you mentioned Camille, so I'd love to hear if you want to talk a little bit more about that as well. Oh. God, I could go on and on about Camille A. Brown. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny, I met Camille A. Brown very briefly some years ago. I think it was a luncheon for Drama Desk or something. And this beautiful woman comes up to me and says, Hi, Ron, how are you? And I was like, Fine, thank you. How are you? I don't know this one. Wait. So I'm talking to her. I had no idea who she was. And she said, Something about having a great day. I said, You too. And I spoke to her a couple of nights ago. I said, Who would have known? That that interaction, you know, would be would precede us coming together in such an extraordinary personal way. So, but to answer your question, um, I think Camille's choreography is extraordinary. I've seen her and her company perform, and they, as good dancers do, they tell a story through dance. And so, from my point of view, this choreo poem brings the best, and we found these actors who are extraordinary, not only in the vocal work necessary to make this happen, but the intentionality of what it is that they're saying. And then you marry that to the language of dance, then you get the choreo poem, right? And she has so brilliantly done that in a way that just blew my mind. I knew she was gonna do great stuff, I'll be honest with you, but. I didn't foresee how extraordinary this experience would be, but I did know that, that I love Camille A. Brown. And so it was without question, the only woman that should produce, um, direct this play. Um, we also made sure that we had an eye toward um, uh, bringing people on the production that were black women, or at least women of color. So if you look at, the demographics of the people from, uh, you know, the music director, you know, to the bassist, um, to the actors, of course, you see a high, high preponderance of women of color. And that's intentional, right? Because we feel like that was also an honor, in honor of what Intizake wanted to see happen, right? That she wanted to uplift women of color. And I feel like this production allows me and anyone who was 
provided or offered to help and bring it to the fore. It allows to, us to lift them. Four women in this show make their Broadway debut in this production. And I can definitely say to you, you will, every single one of these women carry their own weight. They are all, they, this should be a Tony Award winning best ensemble piece because they are extraordinary. Unfortunately, the Tonys do not acknowledge an ensemble, which I think is a travesty because I put these women up against any, any cast that's doing a play on Broadway. I'd say in the last three years, right? Because they do it all. They dance, Stacey is an amazing dancer. You know, she's obviously, a, you know, actor you hear, and I love hearing, thank you for this, Stacey, her process and how she approaches the work. Um, and the, in, the uh, audition process told us a lot about these women, right? Because those who we cast tended to bring that authenticity that we were looking for and that Camille needed to be able to tell the story the way she wanted to tell it. So um, it was about, and of course, they had to be good at what they do, right? There's, we didn't just pick seven women off the street to play these roles. You know, sometimes, I don't even remember Stacey, how many times we had to come back, but we, sometimes we had women come back three, four times, sometimes to read different, you know, colors, blah, 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 before we were like, yep. And some people, you know, you just, you just know. When you, when you, when you see it, you go, yep, she's that, that's who she is. We don't have to do a whole bunch of work to have her understand. We just need her to be authentic in an acknowledgement of herself. And that will bring the character to life, which is kind of like what's, what Stacy said before. Does that answer your question? Oh, absolutely. Thank, yeah. And I, I wanna just, uh, I wanna second that and, and second that shout out to Stacy as well, because it is so much emotional and physical work that she and the rest of the ensemble do. And it definitely deserves um, like a round of applause as it, as it gets. And I think if you saw the show last night and when you're going to see the show, um, the, the work that these uh, these women all do um, that Shange did in the text and, and the ensemble does for what you said, the authenticity, um, the exposure, the emotional exposure and the physical uh, that that brings the experience to, to life in such a great way. And, and I think everyone here has said uh, that brings this experience to life in this way that brings about uh, joy and affirmation. Um, which I, I find very extraordinary uh, about the show is that it, it delves into this, uh, into so much darkness, but in a way that's incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Um, so uh, we're, we're um, about out of time. So I, I just wanted to sort of, um, you know, uh, ask kind of uh, one more question about uh, for, uh, to everyone. So um, just uh, going back to Stacy. Uh, you know, I I'd love to hear uh, you know for someone that hasn't hasn't seen the show, um, if there's anything you know you sort of like to to say of like notice this or look out for this or any you know any sort of like things that you feel like people miss you know after they've seen the show or um, you know any any kind of uh, any anything else to add to sort of the experience. I I can't you know I feel like because this is poetry, depending on what you're walking into that theater with, you're gonna have a different experience. I, there's someone, there's several people that I know that have seen the show four times at this point, and literally every, they've had a different experience every time, but it all culminates into a healing. But they'll see, depending on where they're sitting in the theater, they're like, oh, I, I heard this differently, or this, I saw this differently because of the angle that, I, the perspective that they, they were uh, watching the show from. So, um, I honestly, there's nothing, I never want to force anything on an audience. It truly is going to be the experience that you are meant to have on that particular day. Um, and I think that you will leave that theater. As you said, there's a lot of darkness, but you can't know darkness unless you know joy. And that is where we start and end. Well, that's see what I what I heard from what you said is that that people should see the show four times. 
So I feel like that's the- A uh, minimum, <laughs> at a minimum. That's, that's what I heard. That was the, uh, I, that's a great, um, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. Um, and uh, just to um, want uh, to talk to Professor Griffin, uh, just one more time. I mean, I'd love to then hear, so we know we have to see the show multiple times. If there's anything that we haven't touched on um, as far as what we talked about in the text that, that you'd love to pick out or, or illuminate, or even if it's sort of just a miscellaneous point about, I know the text is so rich. And so we only had an hour if there's is any other you know sort of thing that we might have missed so i would say see it four times <laughs> um and read it also maybe in between those four times take advantage of the opportunity to read it on the page um learn one of the monologues you know because it will live with you that that sorry lives with me because i think i had to learn it in 10th grade for, for something um and then i would also say that ron is right and i put in the chat a piece that I wrote, very short piece, about what I learned about music and art, visual arts, reading and watching Entozake Shange, right? I had never heard of Oliver Lake when I was 17. Um, but because of that line in Shange, I learned about Oliver Lake. And so I would say, you know, this is just a starting point, these brilliant performances. This brilliant work is just a starting point. It will only enhance your life to, to dig into it deeper. i say one more thing. Absolutely. And Ron, so Ron, close us out here and tell us about, you know, the shows running through when and, and all of that. So, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I will tell you that after I have one comment because yes. you asked, you know, was there a moment of something that you missed? There's a moment that strikes me every, well, there's so many moments, but, but one where I feel really privileged to be in the space, and it's the same, I'm not gonna tell you too much about it, except that that there is one actress standing and the other six are laying and sitting on the floor. And there's something about, it's not just how they pose that is so incredibly regal. You look and I see literally queens. I see Nefertiti's and I, I am always going like, my God, these women are beautiful. And not just the body, which is beautiful, but their their souls, all of that. And it's they're literally sitting in lane, but they bring so much to that moment that I was literally, I get awe-inspired. And I look forward to every time I see that show, I'm like, okay, the ancestors are here. Six of them are on stage and they're giving us, and they don't have to say nothing at all. They are just there and I get to experience these queens. It's such a, for me, a beautiful experience. So to answer your question, <clears throat> the show runs until June the 5th. I really encourage you to buy your tickets sooner rather than later because people, of course, once they hear you're gonna close, then they rush to buy tickets. So if you wait till three or four days before we close, the chances are pretty decent, you won't get a seat. So if you wanna ensure your seat, I suggest you, book your tickets as soon as possible. They can be purchased through our website. There's a buy ticket button, www.4coloredgirlsbway.com. Um, and do yourself a favor um, and, 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 and take a moment to dive into, as Professor Griffin and I say, some of the names that you'll hear resonating in the show. Um, there's also, and part of the reason why we decided to extend because we had <clears throat> previously announced we were going to close on March 22nd, but there was this initiative that, um, that has been like a blaze on Twitter where people are buying tickets to gift to people who can't see the show. And that would be, you know, you know, women of color, it could be theater students, and it has so moved me that people, even though they may see it or may not see it, are gifting these tickets to someone. So I wanna put it here in the chat um, so that if any of you um, would think and might want to uh, gift some tickets to someone, um, you can do so. It's an article in the Playbill and in it, it has two links about receiving and donating tickets. So act now, bring a group if you can, because I tell everybody, if you've seen the show, I need you to come back and bring nine of your very dear friends because you get a group discount of 10. So bring your church, your sorority, uh, your fraternity, whatever that you're a part of. If you volunteer somewhere, the YMC, YWC, please, we need you. 
because this is an extraordinary piece of art and the only way it's going to continue if it's been is if it's people patronize it okay so that's my plea to you perfect um thank you so much to um all of our panelists thank you so much um Bron, for um for being here and for talking to us and, and also for giving us that that call to arms of going to see the show so we can see it multiple times uh thank you so much to stacy Star sergeant uh one of the stars of the show for all of your insights and for your beautiful amazing work in the show it's really really incredible and uh thank you to professor griffin for um your incredible insights on shange on the text on the history of it. So um, thank you all so much. And so if you saw the show last night, uh, see it again uh, or buy your tickets now. So um, thanks again, everyone. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah.